So thank you, Allison uh, and Ors, for having me this afternoon. Um, my name is Miles Connors, and I'm the Director of Ecological Services for Parterre Garden Services. Uh, Parterre, as a, as a larger uh, company, uh, manages um, horticulture in the greater Boston area. And Parterre Ecological, in particular, um, focuses on restoration projects in the greater Boston area. We, we deal with um, ecological planning and design, invasive plant management, native restoration, and then ongoing maintenance and monitoring of those, of those particular sites. So we're, we integrate uh, principles of ecology and horticulture to protect, promote, and restore native plant communities. We're a team of designers and educators that plan and implement and maintain a wide range of restoration projects in the greater Boston area. We, produce, we think that we produce resilient solutions that protect open space conservation, promote green infrastructure, and restore native plant habitats in the urban environments. So currently we have a team of about of a dozen of us um, and we're growing pretty significantly every year. We personally uh, see the need for this type of work, uh, both in the landscape trade, but also in our urban environments to really consider like best practices for removing invasive plants from our natural areas, as well as restoring natural native plant communities to them. And that's really what we're, what we're all uh, focused on, on doing. As I mentioned, we focus on ecological planning design, invasive plant management, native plant restoration, stewardship and monitoring. The idea of this too, um, you might be able to see as like, as um, one happening after the other, right? There's like, we start off with good solid like planning and um, really a better understanding each site thinking about the ultimate design, what the place that we want to get to. Most of our projects start out with doing some form of uh, invasive management of the site, whether it's removing Japanese knotweed, buckthorn, multiflora rose, bittersweet, et cetera. Moving into thinking about what that native plant um, restoration might be. And then of course, after a lot of that work has gone on, it, it, it does, uh, there is a form of stewardship, maintenance, monitoring that goes on long-term for, mo for most of these sites. So today in, in particular, I wanted to talk about green infrastructure. Um, and um, I'm sure many of you have, are here because you have an interest in green infrastructure, perhaps on your own property or within your own municipality. Um, it, this is a, an approach to stormwater management that protects, restores, and mimics the natural water cycle. And, you know, the idea of part of our work in working with green infrastructure is really focused upon the functionality of the infrastructure itself, as well as the aesthetic value um, of the infrastructure. We found that, you know, in, in our work, there are contractors uh, and, you know, it will start with engineers and designers that are capable of designing the infrastructure far better than we are. Um, and there are contractors that are, you know, that are out there that are installing and constructing and building them. But many times we found that um, once they're installed, there wasn't necessarily a plan for stewardship and maintenance afterwards. And so that's really where we've like to us, uh, we've stepped in. And that's some of the projects that I want to share with you today. And the idea here is that green infrastructure combines these, some of these natural systems, these native systems that we find in the natural environment. Like if you take, you know, like a, a wetland edge or, a, or an open meadow environment with an engineered system to, to filter and, and clean water, particularly within our urban environments. And green infrastructure provides open space recreation and habitat conservation areas in urban settings. That's another thing on a, particularly in like stormwater wetlands, one of which we'll visit today. Um, you know, we're looking at uh, places like Alewife Reservation as an example, where there's a really good, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, is a really good example of how you have this like functional stormwater wetland that also promotes like open space recreation as well as like conservation value. 
So some of the benefits uh, include biological water quality treatment, right? So rather than like building a, a water treatment plant, we're opening up this constructed wetland to kind of filter water before it re-enters our waterways. We're slowing the flow of stormwater. I mean, even this morning, right? If any, if any of you were on the road, like watching that water rush down streets and into storm drains, like a lot of a lot of these fire retention basins are slowing down the flow of that water, and in the process, cooling it off, um, and and creating habitat value and aesthetic interest in many of our like urban parks along roadways as well as uh, sidewalk areas. So bioretention as a def in, in within the uh, umbrella of green infrastructure, bioretention is site engineered vegetated swales, right? That receive storm water from contributing areas and surface impervious surfaces that slow, store, cool and treat stormwater runoff. Stormwater runoff infiltrates in these areas much of the time, but is often taken up by plants or translocated by other physical and biological processes like within that, within that bioretention system. So the, so the types of bioretention that I wanted to focus on today, I thought I'd start off by just doing some more residential rain garden settings, the projects that we've been involved in and maybe review a couple plant lists, some images of those, and then get into more like stormwater wetlands, particularly with alewife reservation, bioretention swales, uh, planters, and then vegetated curb extensions. So to start with rain gardens, um, rain gardens in particular are vegetated depressions designed and constructed to capture and infiltrate stormwater often in a residential setting. So when people ask me to define like the difference between a rain garden and like a bio basin or a bio swale, like I like to think about rain gardens primarily as being on residential in a residential setting and allowing it to, there's, and there's not usually like an overflow or an underdrain associated with a rain garden. It's associated with infiltration, right? So, um, you know, you, you're making sure that infiltration rates are appropriate uh, based upon the existing soil, like prior to going in and, um, and placing the rain garden. Um, you're making sure that that rain garden is uh, far enough distance from the house that you're not gonna end up with, um, you know, stormwater in your, in your cellar or basement. Um, but they also function to reduce pollutants such as bacteria, nitrogen, phosphorus, heavy metals, oils, and other contaminants that are often found, you know, again, in our urban soils, our urban environments. They promote a native plant aesthetic that provides ecosystem services. And this is one of our specialties. Like I, I should have mentioned at the very beginning, like I'm a plant person. I'm not, I'm not an engineer. I'm a horticulturalist um, by, by trade and by passion. So I'm, I really am more focused on like making making kind of like livable places and making um, some of our urban settings more wild and, uh, and more, um, more livable and many of the spaces more functional for wildlife habitat value and stormwater management and those sorts of things. So that aesthetic value of like how they look, you know, post-construction is a big opportunity for many people. And we've also noticed in these constructions that they are enhanced wildlife habitat value with diversity of trees, shrubs, and perennials. This particular site, this ranch here, um, is actually in Westboro. So it is um, you know, in, within a residential, residential setting in the front of somebody's house. Um, the, the homeowner uh, is a nurse and in particular really likes, the, is a gardener and had a lot of stormwater coming off of a adjacent hillside into the front yard. And so really wanted to like capture that stormwater as it, and, and use it as an opportunity as it entered into the property. So within the rain garden, the native perennial planting palette, this is, as you saw in that initial photograph, like it is more of like an open, uh, you know, full sun environment. So we planted, this list um, in particular of uh, native plant species within that basin. 
And many of this is like, we really started out with a larger context of like these native grasses, right? Like the side oats grama, prairie drop seed and little blue step. These are very like ornamental native plant species. Um, certainly like anyone walking by would still be able to see the house. It's uh, there, you, you know, top out at like around 30 to 36 inches in height. Um, mixed in with that on one side is, is switchgrass, which gets to be a little bit taller. It's more like 36 to 40 inches. And mixed in this, we had, um, the client is also really interested in like kind of blues and purples. So we worked in some Liatris spicata, Northern Blading Star, um, Wild Blue Lupin, Eastern Columbine, and Blue-Eyed Grass. This is a, this is a plant combination that's uh, totally native and, and extremely drought tolerant, very low maintenance. So here we are in the process of like, we've essentially like scratched out the um, location of where the rain garden is gonna be. We've done perk tests. Um, we've talked to the local by, you know, um, conservation commission to make sure that this is something that's gonna be like accept acceptable in the neighborhood. And we've started to, and we've, we've essentially like roughed out and started to lay out in this particular area. On some of those gentle slopes, we then like put, put down um, some seed of the same species that we are planting. Um, and we are putting over the top of this, this rollout straw um, mat, just essentially for, for slope stabilization and also to reduce weed pressures. And you can see that installed here, it really starts to work itself into the surrounding uh, surrounding matrix of planting. And here we are again, just like, you know, laying out the plant material. I wish I had a, a um, later picture of this. The good news is, is that the homeowner completely took over the maintenance of this particular uh, project, which is incredible, right? Like in many ways, I wish I could just go out and help people build these things and then they would take over maintenance. More often than not, we're involved in like the long-term maintenance of these, um, of these garden walkways, uh, walk, um, sorry, um, infrastructure. So some quick math, uh, any engineers out there uh, may uh, find fault with this or quickly um, maybe look at the simplicity of this, but this is just a really quick like off the cuff uh, way of me and like looking at a site, like when I go out to a property and doing some of that quick math to size up a rain garden, right? So we're looking to calculate the square footage of the imperv impervious area, you know, so that being a rooftop driveway, patio, walkway, or even compacted lawn areas that drain into the proposed rain garden location. So what is the square footage of those impervious areas? And then you calculate the total impervious surface area, the length times the width. So let's just assume that it's 450 square feet. You multiply that area by the amount of average rainfall or a rainfall event. Now, much literature will talk about a one inch rainfall. And we know that we've seen like greater rainfalls than that, even in some of the most recent like rainstorms that we've had. So we might want to consider doing a little bit of research um, on that before we just settle on one inches. And you might want to plan for more of like a one and a half to two inch rain event. And you divide by the depth of the proposed rain garden. So let's assume it's like six inches. You just want to like have a gentle slope. So you take the 450 square feet, you multiply it by one, you divide it by the six inch depth, and you end up with 75 square feet of, of rain garden. So that's a that's a general way that we that we um, get into this. And again, many times we're when we're working on a higher capacity um, project, we're working with uh, landscape architect and engineering plans to implement these. But on a residential homeowner scale, we often just use this equation, and it's worked. It's worked very well for us. There's another project uh, in Lexington where um, this is from a few years back. This is this rain garden is more more shady, and so I just wanted to dappled shade, I should say. So I wanted to just like bring this another potential palette of uh, plant material for for a rain garden in a residential area. It's uh, swamp milkweed, 
with fox sedge, and the fox sedge is actually the predominant plant in this particular um, planting. It was put in as plugs, as two inch plugs, and they run fairly rampant and they become kind of like that grassy wild um, matrix within. And then you have like things like swan milkweed kind of poking its head up out and flowering. You have marsh marigold, which is one of the favorite spring plants with that yellow buttercup-like flower. The thick blades of blue flag iris coming in. You can see red cardinal flower in this particular image that flowers a little bit later in the, in the early summer. And then branches of bald cypress are in this image with winterberry and high bush blueberry up around the edges of this particular planting. This is one of the client's uh, favorite parts of their garden, believe it or not, is this corner. Um, as you see, like some of the arborvitae that are uh, dying off on the edges that, uh, side note, we did not plant. Um, you know, the rain garden is uh, doing very well, right? The bald cypress and that winterberry in particular are, you know, structural um, highlights and this low depression around the edges is what's the focal point. This spring, she called me back. Again, she typically takes care of this garden. She called me this spring around the time that this marsh marigold was flowering. And she said a lot of the sedges aren't necessarily coming up. Do you know what might be happening in this particular area? And this gets into a little bit of the maintenance. And in this particular, like this wasn't raked during the dorm dormant season, right? And a lot of those sedges had like settled and you can see some ponding water here. And it had actually covered the drain with a lot of the melting snow and everything that we had in the springtime and rains, like it did not, um, it, the water collected and it was too swampy for the fox edge to come up. So we just simply went in and we, um, we raked it and we exposed this drain. And within a few weeks, the sedges, this is, was taken this spring, the sedges came up. This is also an area that requires very low maintenance. Um, I, I did mention that the client maintains this, but very low maintenance. And this is like, this is three or four years old. So um, it's just like a very natural area that functions to manage stormwater in the, you know, in the corner of her, her yard, which happens to be, I should say, the greater context is she lives at the base of this hill and all this, um, you know, the, in the greater watershed all the storm water comes down and it traditionally kind of pocketed in the base of her, uh, base of her garden area. So does anyone have any questions about what we've covered so far? I, I had a quick question just out of curiosity. Um, the plants that you're including in these pallets, do they occur together in that palette naturally? Or are you kind of piecing together different native plants for their, um, I, I don't know, like pulling them together for these installations? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I would say that, um, you know, that part shape palette, the one in this particular location, is certainly one that is more of a, um, more of a, like a wetland palette. You know, and we can get away with that because it's like, because it is a little bit more part shade. I mean, typically, you know, a lot of our bioretention is drier for most of the season than it ever is wet. So we typically use like a drier palette of native plants, but certainly a lot of the um, native meadows in that original palette where you have things like uh, the prairie drop seed mixed with the panicum grass and little blue stem with liatris, et cetera. Like those pallets do occur in, uh, in nature. I would say that certainly we are uh, manufacturing though that plant pallet for like for aesthetic purposes based upon like, you know, client goals, um, you know, aesthetics of the basin, but certainly also for like functional functionality and habitat value as well. Cool, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Miles, on that particular example, was the drain like a leaching catch basin type thing, or did that lead to somewhere else? It was, yeah. We actually, we essentially had like a dry well underneath. Yeah. It. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Question, um, because so often in these types of residential projects, we have such limited space available, and I'm wondering for a, 
a rain garden like this, how far away would it need to be located from an established mature tree like a maple or an oak or something like that so that it doesn't start to have negative effects, you know, with too much moisture at the roots of the, the large tree? Great question. Yeah, I would definitely be out from underneath the canopy of that tree and certainly probably another, you know, 20, 25 feet out from that canopy if possible. I mean, literature also talks about the house and being at least 10 feet away from the house. I would probably be farther than that as well. You know, but a lot of this also has to do with the permeability of soils um, and the structure of the soil at the, at the location. Um, I would, you know, but, but for the trees, I would definitely be out from underneath the canopy of, of, the, of the tree. You know, the other thing associated with this too is like, if you are, it's also about grading, right? So if you're a lot, and a lot of the tree roots are at the surface of the soil, but if you already have um, a, a opportunity, I would say, where there's a lower depression associated with the existing landscape and there are already, you know, tree roots there and perhaps you've got, you know, you're noticing that there's like silver maple or like tupelo or um, something of that nature where, you know, it is historically a little bit more wet or perhaps in um, a, a floodplain environment. Like you could almost use that as an opportunity to create it a rain garden naturally, right? So getting away from a little bit from the infrastructure and the engineering, but moving more into like the plant palette and then and naturalizing that area for um, for stormwater runoff. If that helps. <laughs> yes, thank you. So getting into stormwater wetlands, um, you know, we we had an opportunity to work with um, Alewife Reservation for a number of years. Um, we are currently not under contract with the city of Cambridge to maintain this wetland. There's a, a, a sister company, or not sister, but a uh, another company that does work similar to ours, Essex Horticulture, that currently has that contract. It is a contract that is put out to bid every three years. Um, they won the bid this past, uh, they, this uh, last season, and we, um, but we had the opportunity to work at Alewife Reservation for uh, approximately, I think, eight or nine years. And this went from the time of it being implemented and constructed from the contractor all the way up until this past year. So it, we um, gained a lot of knowledge during that time, worked with a lot of uh, great uh, people, including, um, you know, bioengineering group and Kleinfelder and the city of Cambridge, among other people to um, watch this stormwater wetland evolve. So stormwater wetlands are on a fairly large scale, right? Like Alewife Reservation is three and a half to four acres um, of, and of a area that was once an overgrown invasive like floodplain. Right, it was originally on uh, DCR property. It was abutting the um, the end of Cambridge Park Drive where Pfizer once lived. If any of you are aware of that area, um, it is. This is actually the Pfizer, the old Pfizer building in this image. Um, and the it was a collective effort over many years to install this wetland that today like collects, filters, slows, and cools urban stormwater during peak flows to protect adjacent streams and rivers, right? In this particular demonstration, like it's collecting approximately 400 uh, acres of stormwater off of Cambridge streets in this larger constructed wetland, filtering it out before it ties back into the little river, which then drains, drains into the Charles. So it collects large volumes of water. Um, it settles out urban debris. It slows and cools the water from our urban streets and it absorbs um, much nutrients that are coming off of our streets as well. This is a really basic model. I mean, a lot of information on this particular project, uh, this, but the city of Cambridge Department of Public Works with engineering teams collaborated with the uh, Department of Conservation and Rec to design sewer separation and stormwater management measure to protect the, the surrounding waterways. 
So this was a sewer separation project. And today it provides open space conservation benefit and ecological value of approximately 400 acres of catchment of stormwater from Cambridge streets. And this is, this is a, a little bit, sorry, I thought that this was more clear. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but this is the, this is the wetland four bay. So just a quick, you know, layman's engineering here. Like there is a approximately like an eight to 10 inch culvert where all of the stormwater drains ultimately end up into this larger culvert and it, they all drain out into this wetland four bay. It's a tiled four bay where all the sediment, it's like the, the um, gravel and grit and cigarette butts and bottles all settle out into this four bay. In the time that we worked there, it was cleaned out once. Um, and it is a large bay where like all the initial water comes into. There's then a very shallow, a very narrow water quality or storm water swale. This is highly vegetated. It has like dense plantings of woody like willows and elderberries and button bush and, and dogwoods mixed with like rushes and other sedges. It's very dense and it's like, in its comp plant composition before it like breaks out into this more like open um, wetland habitat. It's engineered so the water flows and in a, in a specific direction. It has larger, deeper pool areas like in these particular regions here and, and also areas that are more shallow. And a lot of that has to do with, with the, um, the, the plant compositions that were chosen for each particular area. And over, like it, it basically, it drains out as it overflows. There's a couple of outlet swales that tie into the little river, which you see here. Um, and in larger storm events, there's a, there's a wet meadow floodplain where the entire system would breach um, over paths and then essentially flow out over through this wet meadow and right out into the river itself. So I thought that based upon, um, Allison actually shared with me some of the people that were gonna be attending today. And so I kind of, I, I increased like some of the composition of, of what our contract looked like. Cause I thought it would be interesting for people to kind of better understand the complexity of like, you know, what goes into making sure that a system like this is maintained well. Um, the city of Cambridge um, has a, has a maintenance contract into perpetuity is my understanding. So the reservation will always be, always have some form of funding utilized to, uh, to maintain this, this uh, stormwater wetland. So the contract itself is for vegetation management program for the alewife stormwater wetland, which also includes 16 bioretention basins up in the Cambridge neighborhoods that filter stormwater before they come down in and eventually enter into the Alewife Reservation. Uh, and also Danahy Park stormwater channel in Danahy Park in Cambridge for the City of Cambridge Public Works Department. So within the contract, there is, there is a lot of monitoring and reporting on top of the maintenance. Right, and a lot of this goes into like the DPW, it goes into being able to create long-term reports about how things are going. But I've kind of mapped some of those out here where you have these different item numbers. And these are essentially what we bid on, right? Where we have initial site visit and report. Like we would go with a project manager um, who maybe some of you know, Duke Bitsko, um, who now works at, is the, um, the discipline design director at Hatch Engineering. He's been the project engineer for, um, for Alewife Reservation. We also work with him on other projects. We meet with him as well as the Department of Public Works director annually, several times a year, uh, meetings on site to review, to walk, to better understand the system. So that within that, there's that initial site visit and report. There's biannual inspection and report. There's maintenance reports. And then there's the maintenance. Spring cleanup, where we initially go in, we'll cut back some of the panicum grasses. We'll clean out um, some of the overflows, some of the basin areas. There's the growing season vegetation 
management, which is basically more of like the care and then ongoing maintenance of the stormwater. It's more of the stewardship and gardening. Fall cleanup, uh, winter cleanup, management and dethatching of that wet meadow to just, again, make sure that it, you know, it's a wild meadow space, but it also functions like we just making sure that there's no blockages, et cetera. And then additional maintenance, like on occasion, there are things that come off that require additional maintenance. So there were, there are, um, per, per uh, contract, there were like, you know, approved additional maintenance visits by the city of Cambridge. And then there was also a provisional sum for materials. Like, let's say we lost a tree or, you know, we decided that we wanted to add a few more hundred plugs in a particular landscape plugs in a few areas. Like that was that provisional sum for particular um, plantings. And then on top of that, there were like kind of prerequisites, if you will. There's a professionalism associated with what they were looking for, for the person to be able to do this work. Um, so the landscape management staff should consist, and again, this is in the contract, of professionals with experience in wetland hydrology, a sound knowledge of wet, wetland botany, and the ability to key out and identify the invasive species list in my pack. So that's the acronym, right, for Massachusetts Invasive Plant Advisory Group. The staff shall be familiar with the requirements of the Alewife Stormwater Wetland Vegetation Management Plan that was put together by Duke Bitsko and team at Hatch and, and prior with Bioengineering Group and the Cambridge Conservation Order of Conditions prior to commencing any work. For us as a team as well, they want us to have certain qualifications, except during the winter cleanup period where it's basically like you could just have somebody go up and rake out leaves. At least one of the members of the staff at all times shall be a mass certified horticulturalist, have a Massachusetts Invasive Plant Management Certification, have completed the National Green Infrastructure Certification Program, and be a licensed pesticide applicator when applying herbicides. So I wanted to share this with you basically on this idea, like if you are in a position where you're like maintaining green infrastructure, it, I have, we have fixed many issues that have pertained to other landscape companies that have come in and not been able to identify invasive plants or know how to properly maintain green infrastructure. So I'm by no means saying hire us, but what I am saying is, is like really consider who you are hiring. And if you are in a position to put in specifications in your bid, consider doing so um, in, in, in some respect to make sure that the people who are bidding on your projects are qualified to maintain the green infrastructure. So then I just wanted to share, and maybe if there are some questions, I'm happy to answer those about stormwater wetland management. Um, the, but these are just some images. This happens to be ironweed and goldenrod in that wet meadow floodplain, that overflow area. You can see the path cycling around with the bridge and the main wetland in the back. This is in actually probably right around this time of year. This is at the beginning of June. Um, probably most likely with pensamin digitalis in full flower. Later in summer, uh, Panicum virgatum, our native switchgrass, comes in um, as these plant as the pensamin digitalis is is uh, is going to seed and kind of going into the backdrop. Areas where this you know highly designed and like and constructed um, boardwalk and everything goes through. You know, we have things like um, Alnus and Sambucus and, and um, you know, Panicum grass and Buttonbush and hibiscus uh, flowers in the, in, the lower, in the lower wetland. And of course, a big part of this too is also for wildlife. And we're also, you know, on many occasions, there's like migrating birds and herons that are out fishing and ducks that are nesting and uh, monarchs that are, that are uh, eating milkweed and snapping turtles that are laying eggs on top of on top of mounds. As much as we tried to like uh, see this, this the snapping turtles would come in every year and they would like continuously like disturb the disturb the soil. 
So are there any questions about stormwater wetland management or contracts? I'd be curious what, uh, like, and with the, the, the rain gardens to what have been the biggest maintenance problems that you've seen? What, yeah. Um, yeah, so I would say, you know, certainly they're low lying areas. So in water, in stormwater events or in wind events, or, you know, because they're low lying, they end up like uh, being buried in leaves in the fall. They end up uh, having trash consistently washed into them. Like, so there's always sediment and debris that wants to wash into them because they're kind of like these bellies in the landscape. And so I would say that that's one of the big things is that when we're, when we're maintaining and managing these sites, we're initially going to pick up trash in many respects. Um, and that can vary from, you know, soda cans to, uh, to unfortunately to needles to um, there last year we found an ironing board in one of our basins, like just random shopping carts uh random things that would that will impede flow certainly leaves um i would say too are, are another thing for that we're you know consistently trying to like clean up and in, in these particular basins to allow water to flow through them and areas not to get clogged i do have a couple images of that and then and then really like plant care right so we're we're looking to manage a lot of these for aesthetic interest as well to make them. Uh, I, I talk a lot to my team about the idea that I feel like with us maintaining and stewarding these 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 bioretention systems, that part of our work is making them more like acceptable in communities because we've had people come out and quite frankly frankly yell at us about the fact that we've taken up a parking spot, right? Like a lot, of, a lot of these like curb bump outs and these some of these swales are actually in areas that used to be like parking, which is very limited in some of these urban areas. So I feel like part of our job too is like maintaining them in such a way that they're like presentable to people and they become like these little pocket gardens. As part of Alewife 2, we also do, so this is just an example of some of the monthly monitoring reports that we do for Alewife. I thought this might be interesting for people to just see from a reporting standpoint. Again, this was all required in the bid. This is not just us like writing, you know, gardening notes. This is like, where this is required uh, in the bid and we're, you know, paid to put together these reports, which are then compiled into an annual report and submitted to conservation every year. And it's all actually public record as well. So, you know, this is a monthly monitoring report that we that we put together um, with oversight from, uh, from project managers and directors at the DPW. You know, part of us is looking at like, you know, how many hours we, were we on site? When are we on site? The hydrology observations at, you know, different locations of the four bay wetland basin and out at the oxbow. So the oxbow is actually out at the at Little River. So we're looking at like water levels in terms of like, are they you know higher or lower than the actual water level out at the at the river itself? Proposed work activities for the following month, you know, really considering not only what we're doing today, but what we're doing, you know, forecasting forward. Thinking about like what we're looking at for like wildlife observations at the site, like what did you see today? at the site. Um, so, you know, and, you know, putting together pictures, right? So we have in certain locations, this on the left-hand screen here, um, we happened to have um, a, a lady that would come every day um, and she was, in her, she was in a wheelchair and she commented to us that um, she couldn't see over the panicum grass and she'd like to be able to see the larger well. And so one of the one of the things that we came up with is we we actually chopped the panicum grass down at, at this time of year actually it was around June and so it would flush new growth but it would be much shorter and it would allow her observation. We also found that we could use some of those uh, panicum grass clippings to suppress some of the knotweed. Certainly wouldn't get rid of it and eradicate it, but it would suppress it, especially as we get in get into deeper layers of it. 
um, and, and so forth. So there's other things associated with many of the plants and animals and other vegetation associated with that, with that larger system. So bioretention swales, um, this, this is like we're coming down. So we're off of like a residential rain garden and we're coming and we went into like a larger engineered system of looking at a, a stormwater wetland system. And now we're looking at bioretention swales. So these swales are often in urban environments. Like this happens to be in Dorchester um, at Peabody Square, like a super urban environment. And I wanted to show this because it's like, it's early spring. This might've actually been one of our like spring cleanup visits. And you can see like, you know, all the trash, like it's everything, just people throw things into it, but it also, the wind blows trash into it. You can also see that it's like, you know, it's been fairly recently mulched. There is some education about, you know, the presence of this particular basin. Um, but this is like, this is just like this small little pocket of like native green in a very dense urban location. And so again, we try over time, like we were consistently adding plants to this Peabody Square in particular. And it has things like Virginia Sweet Spire, um, Winterberry. It has tupelos on the opposite side of the walkway with red maples mixed in. The banks are all covered with spirabilis, uh, the prairie drop seed, as well as different carex varieties. We have blue flag with lobelia in here. And this is, this is another swale that goes through. Uh, this is Elliott Norton Park in Boston. And this is, again, an early spring visit as things are starting to emerge, where the swale is like water comes in and moves through and goes out. And that's like one of the definitions of this is like, the swell, the water comes in and moves through and goes out. And a lot of times it will, it, as it you know filters through this area, it will then tie back into some other type of like stormwater infrastructure in the, in the, in the greater scheme. But, I, but we feel that like it's our responsibility to like really kind of like vegetate these areas. So it's like water comes through, it, it filters out, it slows down, it cleans and it cools. So these bioretention swales are shallow vegetated depressions with high infiltration soil media with optional under drain and over, overflow structures. So you'll see in this picture, and I think I show a picture closer up later, like the, the overflow structure in this particular, um, this particular bioretention swale is called a, is a beehive. This is a cast iron beehive. And um, it allows like as water comes up and, and, and it often rises up with like parts of debris and leaf and bottles and so forth. It allows the water to still flow over while not uh, clogging this particular drain. This particular site is on um, Fresh Pond Parkway. So, you know, close to maybe between like Fresh Pond and um, Mount Auburn Cemetery, very busy corner, right? And this is a spring cleanup. Like this is, this is kind of like, it. this is how ugly it looks in like March. And we come in, we cut back all the panicum grasses, we're picking up sticks, we're raking out the basin. You can see the traffic all backed up. Uh, we're dusting off some of the sidewalks. But we're also cleaning, cleaning out this inlet, right? Like you can see what's happening like in that inlet where those like cast iron goes down into that sediment, the, that catch base in there. You can also see the beehive again, like in that lower, in that, in this lower um, basin here. And I'll show a couple pictures of this. Like this is water actively flowing through. So there's obviously overflow into the stormwater drain, but a majority of water is actually captured like into this, into this inlet here. And in the early spring, we need to, you know, over the winter, it just fills with sediment. So we go in and we clean out all this organic matter and allow that water to cleanly flow like down into that um, flow into that catchment basin. And this is a, this is a close up of that beehive overflow structure 
inside the lower basin. You can you can see how the water, you know, just essentially like raised up in a storm event, and all of that leaf debris and everything just captured itself against it, but still allowed it to overflow into the stormwater structure. And then this is later in the season. Notice there's still traffic on the street. <laughs> um, but in, the, you know, I'll also say too that we really promoted native plants uh, in these urban environments, like in, in, but you'll see here that there is some nepeta, like on the, on the edge of this, um, on the edge of the curbin. But there's also a lot of panicum grass, there's itea and echinacea, rebecca, blue flag iris. Uh, Carex, Baptisia, Roos Grolo, there's a lot of plant diversity just within this very small, you know, pocket garden um, in these urban streets. And I, I like to think that as people are sitting in traffic, that they're able to like look over and see this and it like creates some sense of like peace, calming and like and, and pleasure as they're and the, as they're sitting in their air conditioned vehicle waiting for the light to turn green. So Miles, uh, one quick question. What are you doing with a lot of the debris, the sediment, the stuff that's collected? It might have, you know, who, who knows, you know, just urban kind of <laughs> debris there. Is it being composted, stored somewhere? Yeah, it is, it is, being, it is being composted. Um, we have a compost uh, facility. We actually tested it for a while. Um, the organic. Um, there is certainly uh, some heavy metals that are found in it, uh, high bacteria count on, on some of the samples. Um, we, we like to think that probably some of that has to do with uh, high nitrogen levels a lot of times. So you can start to see maybe where some of this comes from, like bacteria might be from, uh, you know, might occur naturally, but it could also be like some dog, you know, some dog waste. Uh, you know, the nitrogen levels could be coming from um, from stormwater runoff off of uh, lawn treatments um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, among other things. Again, it's like non-point, right? So you don't necessarily know where it's coming from, but we, we do compost it um, and we test it before, um, you know, before it samples on, you know, frequent, fairly frequently. Um, but what we found is um, it's not necessarily suitable for super urban environments. So we tend to mix it in with other, with other um, debris that we have from, from gardens from when we're composting. Got it. So planters, um, so we, we were looking at swales, right? And so now we're moving into bioretention planters. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, you know, they're, they could be nicknamed like bioretention planter boxes or cells. They're often walled enclosures. Um, I've, I've most often seen them with like, as like granite curbing or cement curbing. Um, they usually have like these, these little inlets that have been, you know, carved into the side of the curbing itself that allow water to, to flow in off the sidewalks. And then there's stormwater grate that allows the water to flow into the box itself. So they're vertical walled reservoirs with their have designed uh, soil media intended for infiltration. They, they either have an open bottom to allow infiltration into native soil, right? So they're, they've actually done the engineered perk tests and they know that there's, there's soil in the sub layers that where the water will be able to like infiltrate into back into groundwater or more commonly they're lined with an under drain that's tied back into the stormwater infrastructure itself so the water spills into this and again it slows it it cools it and then moves it into back into the larger system these are most often used in urban settings. Uh, they're often adjacent to sidewalks or streets with walled concrete, rock like this granite, or steel face curbs. And this happens to be on Fawcett Street in Cambridge next to uh, Iggy's, um, if any of you frequent Iggy's in Cambridge. So this is that walled uh, in enclosure. You know, you can see the stormwater grate where the water comes off the street and you've got that, this like six inch like bluestone riprap 
to deal with the velocity of that water as it comes in. And then the, these walls accept uh, like all the water that come into this particular location. And I thought this was kind of a fun time lapse of like, you know, early spring and as you move in through summer. Um, also, like the simplicity of just having like a monoculture of plants, right? Like in this particular wild environment, like you have little blue stem and blue flag iris, and that's it. Like you get like a little punch of color with a blue flag uh, in flower, kind of going out of flower right now, this time of year. And then you, the, and then the, um, and then the little blue stem grass as it comes in late summer as a warm season grass really fills those basins in and has beautiful fall color. And we would typically leave it up through the, through the winter months. It would get uh, pummeled by snow plows and then we go in and we would, uh, you know, cut it back and clean it up in the springtime. Vegetated curb extensions. So again, th this is similar to the swales where like water, my, like my interpretation anyway, is that water is moving through them. They're also known as bulb outs or bump outs. Um, they are bioretention typically located along a road and within an area where the curb line has been extended directly into the road or into the street. Water enters through this curb cut. There's typically a gentle slope, so water will move through and filter before exiting on the other side. There is, a, there is some infiltration certainly with bioretention soils and and uh, and some um, uh, and some like uh, dams. I'm forgetting the term that's used in green infrastructure, but there's other curbing associated with overflows along the way. But they're often used in the residential setting for traffic calming and aesthetic interest as well. And you can kind of see here the larger context of that swale during a rain event. You know, you've got two inches of water in this larger storm, like that, like a storm like we had this morning, where what, all of a sudden there's a huge influx of like storm water that comes through this system. This particular basin um, you go into as it first enters in, it has um, northern sea oats, chasmanthium, and then there's like other like the, in the middle picture here you see eupatorium or Joe pie weed, and then it moves into other cells where you have, um, you know, panicum grass mixed with obedient plant and other, other um, iris uh, versicolor, blue flag iris. And there's just some other images of this too, like in springtime after we've done a little bit of mulching, and some echinacea with some of that panicum grass and flower. And there are also the, this first image on the left here also shows like some of these like little spillways where you have this um, piece of granite with a little scoop out of it in the center. And the, as the water spills over, it's actually spilling into these larger kind of like tumbled stone basins. So it's a great design. It's a lot of fun to watch like during a, during a rainstorm, like watching the water move through these events, watching how the, the vegetation slows the water. Um, and how the water is slowed down before it exits down below. I also thought it'd be interesting to kind of show a basin that had been that had failed. Um, this was in Cambridge. This is on the corner of Whittemore, not far from Alewife uh, Alewife Station. Um, and it is uh, you can see tread marks through the corner here where there's, we've come to find out it was a trash truck, a, a, a town municipal truck that was like, that was not able to make the turn and just consistently drove through it. The sign had been consistently hit. It had also not been built properly. There was, it was not infiltrating. It was completely covered with invasive vegetation and the, the, the sides had collapsed and it was non-functional. So we went in and we completely excavated it. We dug it out. We um, put riprap sides in on, on the corners. We made curb cuts into the edges of the, um, into the, the granite here. You can see those where the riprap bluestone is here. So this is right before planting. And we planted with a diversity of different native plant species, including Rebecca, little blue stem, echinacea, 
Um, this is um, the, the orange is Asclepias uh, tuberosa or butterfly milkweed. We've seen many uh, monarch caterpillars like in this matrix, like in this very like urban area, uh, taking advantage of the fact that this milkweed plant is here. You also see this boulder um, that we located on the corner of the of the basin to uh, to try to keep um, larger trucks from from driving over, and it was actually quite successful in in doing that. Um, any questions? I want to move into a little bit of like invasive management too in some of these basins, just from a broad standpoint. But any questions? Miles, what would you say to a <clears throat> Um, uh, like say BPW or somebody else who might be concerned about, um, you know, the collection of water, the ponding of water in some of these and potential like damage to pavement due to freeze thaw cycles and things like that. I would say that that really has to do with the, the engineering, right? Mm -hmm. And thing of it, if you have if you have engineered soils or the, that are made for infiltration um, and you have good engineering where the water is allowed to flow into these basins and they either infiltrate and if they don't infiltrate, they're allowed to overflow. And if those areas are kept free of any type of you know, debris or other impediment, that like you should really not have any standing pooling water. Like, mm -hmm. all this green infrastructure, with the exception of the stormwater wetland, like is really intended to infiltrate and move water through within like within 24 to 48 hours. So if you have pooling water in any of these basins, um, you're really you're in a place where uh, there's there's something that's failed in the in the end, either the engineering or the construction standpoint of these basins. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, part of our work, as I mentioned at the beginning, is dealing with invasive plants. So I thought it'd be nice to just kind of go through a few slides here about like what we, because we do all this work within basins and within these basins as well, right? So we're looking, when we go out to many of these, uh, you know, we find poison ivy right, that has seeded itself in. And although it's a native plant, we consider it noxious, particularly in an environment like this, where, um, where there's, you know, a lot of people, it's highly urban, it's not necessarily a native plant that we want in that particular environment. What we, you know, when we're working on conservation areas, like we let it be, we, we obviously let it be present and let it be wild. Um, but we talk a little bit about, you know, the description of what that plan is, the habitat, and also the management. Um, so we typically do not try to come in contact with poison ivy, obviously with our bare hands. If there's small little identified uh, sprouts, we will hand pull them with gloves on uh, or even with a plastic bag, right? Like we'll just pull them out of the ground. Um, but typically, if it's like a larger vine or something uh, that's a larger population that's adjacent, as I also mentioned in the beginning, we are herbicide applicators. So we will do particular like site specific applications to some of this woody invasive plant material in order to manage them out. Much of this has to do with, you know, they, they use the term early, de early detection rapid response. It has to do with like early identification of what invasive plants are in these particular locations and then like how best to remove them. A lot of times we find things like poison ivy. We have even our native grape that moves in. Um, this is again, great for a conservation area, um, an open meadow, but not necessarily like in an urban, in, like an urban uh, bioretention facility. That again, it's an engineered uh, facility that we want to keep fairly, fairly open and managed. A lot of garlic mustard moves in. We have things like uh, black swallowwort in our urban environments that consistently come in. So these are either, they're typically managed in a way in these facilities where we can identify them as seedlings and do uh, hand pullings or other herbicide application techniques. So there's manual hand removal. That's 95% of what we're doing in these particular basins. 
as well as like the constructed wetland areas. Um, occasionally we will do fuller applications, absolutely not in any conservation area, but, um, but certainly within like more upland areas when we're specifically dealing with a monocrop of one particular species. It could be like a massive like bittersweet or, um, you know, that's on the ground or, you know, black swallowwort in a meadow. Like we would do a spot application of, of foliar spray. Again, this is licensed, experienced herbicide applicators with a very low volume of herbicide in the natural environment. I often tell people I did not get into this business to use herbicides in my own home, like I'm an organic farmer. Like I don't, I, I wish that we didn't necessarily have to have herbicides in our tool bag, but I do firmly believe that it is a necessity for dealing, especially with specific plants you know, things like Japanese knotweed, um, you know, uh, Phragmites, swallowwort on, on a larger scale. And then, of course, mechanical management, too. Like, a lot of times we'll move into areas and we'll just, like, consistently mow in order to uh, manage particular plant species out. Uh, so part of our, when we, when we look at herbicide application as well, there's a couple other different means. I would say probably 95% of the herbicide application we do is a cut and dab treatment. So that's going into some of these or some of these urban wilds and identifying the fact that we have like a large stand of buckthorn or multiflora rose or bittersweet and actually cutting and making a fresh applica application directly to the stump. We use a blue dye, as you can see in this particular image. To, um, to make sure that we identify where those uh, treatments have occurred. Um, and typically it is done around, you can also see around the perimeter of the plant, the cambium of the plant, where the, where the xylem and phloem are flowing up and down in the, in the plant itself. Um, we also do basal bark treatment. We found basal bark treatment to be highly effective with tree of heaven. We've, we used to, early on, about five years ago, we would, uh, we would cut and dab Tree of Heaven only to find that it would sucker in, in madness. And so what we've done uh, recently is actually we've done a basal bark treatment, which is a really fancy way of saying that you're essentially like spraying around the perimeter of the, of the bark itself, around the, the um, root flare or the base of the plant. And it is taken into the tree and it kills actually larger, large stands of um, things like tree of heaven. And then we come in and we'll, we'll remove the tree of heaven after it's, after it's died. A lot of times too, I'd also recommend that you leave snag habitat. So if, if you're certainly maybe not in a more urban situation, um, although I have seen that, but more of in a conservation location, you can leave snag habitat, which could be like a 20, 25, 30 foot uh, stump where, you know, you can have like nesting birds, raptors that perch, um, endless amounts of insects and other uh, birds that will, uh, that rely on that um, decaying dead tree habitat. Removal and disposal with Japanese knotweed, where we could probably do a whole presentation on that. But uh, typically this time of year, we cut it. If, and if outside of a wetland environment, we usually stack it and leave it on site, which is uh, people are always like, what? But we literally have found that those canes will dry and dry and die on site, just like what they do in the fall after the frost hits them. They will, they will dry and decompose on site. So we'll cut it this time of year and then in late summer, as it comes into flower, we will go in and do either a cut and dab treatment, or if permitted, a, um, a, a, a foaming or foliar treatment directly topically to the leaves. We found that topical treatment to the leaves will give you like an 80, like 80, 85% reduction in Japanese knotweed in one season. We've had really good luck. We've worked with several municipalities uh, to manage out Japanese knotweed. Just earlier this week, I was in a 
I was at a uh, town composting facility where uh, the town engineer asked me to come and take a look at doing some invasive plant management. It, it, the, the, it abuts uh, town forests where they want us to manage Japanese knotweed. And all through the loam pile, was Japanese knotweed. You could see it sprouting over the top. You could see it sprouting in the sifted soil. And so they have a much larger problem on their hands because I'm, I assume that much of that loam is going out to be spread along roadways and in different areas. So we kind of stepped back a little bit and they're looking at the different um, options with that particular issue. Um, so, you know, bittersweet, we typically, you know, cut it at the base, usually starting around this time of year, and then we move it back uh, and we leave it in the trees. Like if it's up in a tree, we'll leave it hanging in that tree and we will uh, and we'll start to manage it at the ground level. So we have, uh, again, we're looking at Japanese knotweed treatment. So this is like, you know, these larger areas of like cutting in and, uh, and dropping the Japanese knotweed in these particular areas, stacking it, allowing it to dry, and then coming back later in the season and doing a topical treatment. You can see in this lower right-hand uh, photograph here, that is a foam application. I don't think I have a, a image, but we have these foam applicator guns. And essentially there's like a foaming uh, agent that's on the inside. It's mixed with the herbicide and the blue dye. And it comes out as a foam that then dissipates into a liquid once, right? But we, we can essentially create like a small dollop of uh, foaming herbicide agent on each one of those leaves. We don't have to even cover the entire plant, but we cover the top section of those plants. And again, that like topical application really does an effective job of translocating into the root system and killing off that, killing off the knotweed. In many of our plans, which we put together for conservation, these are many of these are pages taken from those plans that we put together for conservation approval. You know, we also put together um, a map of associated like timing for when we do particular invasive plant management. So this shows like can remove it, moving of seedlings and saplings, usually less than one inch in caliper. We can reach down low, reach our hand around and rip out something that's about one inch or three quarters or so um, less in caliper size. And once you get above that, we're usually getting into, you know, cutting and dabbing species. I also look into certain times of year of doing seeding, planting and live staking which I, you know, after everyone dreads like the, the invasive management and the, and the use of herbicides in our work, um, I, I like to talk about native restoration techniques such as live staking. We do a lot of stream bank um, restoration uh, along, you know, streams, brooks, rivers, along wetland edges. And we use this particular, a lot of different species that are suitable for live staking. You know, that includes willows, including pussy willow, silky dogwood, red osier dogwood, red twig dogwood, alders, elderberries, viburnums, uh, button bush. So these are all great species that you can um, essentially take a dormant three foot stake. So this would be any time from like November through March, as long as the ground is workable. And if you take that three foot stake and, um, and you pre-pilot a uh, a hole in the earth using a piece of rebar and a metal hammer. And you, you, this is about two feet down into the ground and exposing about a foot underground. The following year, we've had about like, I would say 70 to 80% of really good success with, um, with the plant pushing new growth once, uh, once springtime comes around. Seeding, we do a lot of dormant seeding as well as uh, native wildflower seeding on particular sites. We also, after the seeding occurs, we manage meadows into a full stable, um, you know, a plant community. And we really look to look to different methods. We, we many times will just go right to like New England wetland plants or earned seeds or prairie moon among other vendors. And we will get mixes. 
right? It could be like showy New England wildflower mix, or it could be like a New England wet mix. Um, but oftentimes we will also really start to tailor specific species for specific areas and start to like customize some of our mixes. But it's a wonderful way to like, you know, to colonize bare earth around like many of these areas that have been uh, disturbed post invasive plant management. Um, some of these pages too were also taken from a rail trail with all, uh, so this is a uh, Kachituate Rail Trail, which is near my house that we recently did a uh, plan for. Um, but this just shows like some of the species for a median planting. And I thought that would be interesting for you too. Like this is like an extremely hot and dry and drought tolerant median, median planting. So you have things like our wild column, Eastern Columbine, which is Aquilegia canadensis, like mixed in with Asclepias tuberosa, Geranium maculatum, a GM triflorum, cisrhynchium, blue-eyed grass, like one of my favorite new plants, and then um, and then aster, right? Like different aster varieties as well, uh, and really trying to improve some of these urban areas. I know that you know many of you have like these little curb bump outs. Many of the specs are just like are like what you see here. It's like it's just like black-eyed Susan with like little blue stem, right? Because they know that's what will do well. But there's a lot of other native drought tolerant species that will do well in these particular locations. Um, and with that, I'm, you know, I conclude the presentation and uh, we'll would love to answer any other questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Miles. I had a quick question, which is. Um, several of the people here are working for municipalities and which roles have you seen being really successfully taken on by municipal staff, maybe DPW staff, or can they, can there be training and things like that, where some of this maintenance, once these things are installed, could be taken on? Yeah, certainly. I mean, we have, um, you know, a lot of time to, to be completely honest, the most successful, the most successful um, examples that come to mind first is when the municipality not only thinks of the engineering design and construction, but also the long term maintenance, right? So, and sometimes that maintenance comes from from experts that are, you know, like ourselves, where you know, you're, you've got a certain population of, of uh, engineered green infrastructure that you're looking to manage and put into a, a bid proposal. Um, but it could also come from, and that's, that's where, where I've seen it most successful is like, is, is actually having the funding to be able to go in and have somebody responsible and under contract to maintain it. I would say secondary to that, like having friends groups and volunteer groups in, in local neighborhoods. We've also worked a great deal with some of those community groups too, to educate them on some of the invasive plant management techniques. Although, you know, herbicide use needs to be done with a, with a licensed applicator uh, if it's not on your own property. Um, we've done some invasive plant management techniques with, with uh, community members and volunteer groups, as well as uh, some of the native plant restoration. So, and a lot of that has been transferred into them feeling more confident in taking on some of those responsibilities, right? Many of these bioretention basins are like outside of uh, people's homes. They're alongside uh, streets that they walk by and walk on every day on their way to work. We've been involved in you know, even some of the like street plantings and so forth with like most recently we did one in East Boston with Tree Easty where um, we, we, we purchased and delivered trees that, but it was all based on grant funding. And we, they worked with, we worked with the local community groups there to essentially like have them install the trees. And then they signed up to be stewards and, and take care of those particular trees. And in, in all of these situations too, I think it just takes, like it really takes a dedicated person um, to, take, to take that on, that stewardship responsibility, if it is from a volunteer standpoint. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, there's many, I feel like there's many different ways in which we can, uh, we can maintain these, but a lot of times it does have to do with being able to identify and recognize what the invasive plant species is and thinking about the best appropriate native species as a, as a replacement. Great, thank you. Any other questions? We're running up to our deadline, but are there any other questions that uh, Miles can, while well, we've got him here? Yeah, I, Miles, I thought, uh, I just want to thank you again as well. I thought this was perfectly practical and, um, you know, functional advice, which I think is exactly what we are looking for, especially in an implementation focused coalition. So I will be um, quickly sending this off to our own superintendent of streets, who I know had wanted to attend today, but this is the kind of information that's uh, perfect for them to be hearing as well. So thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And we'll say a goodbye. Have a, it's not Friday, but have a beautiful weekend. Hope you're enjoying the summer. Get out there. Oh, oh, and if you really dislike those invasives, join our Weed Warriors program. <laughs> That's through the Soasco Sisma. We'll put that on the webpage as well. But um, we really encourage people to get involved, learn more, uh, get your neighbors, everybody together, because invasives kind of need us all. Uh, to work um, against them. Um, so, and we appreciate the pros out there like Miles who, who, who has been, who have been advising us and, and helping, um, helping us deal with that because that's not something that's going away either. So thanks everybody. And we'll see you next round at our next meeting. We haven't planned the date yet, but we will let you know. I had a quick, uh, if you have a minute, Allison and or sure. Miles even, um, there's, uh, idea I've been kind of working on to develop a um, workforce development program and maybe get some sort of grant funding to do that and partner with ideally several organizations, including, you know, municipalities and consulting groups and try to do a green infrastructure, you know, workforce development program and invasive, you know, sustainable land management with and for those types of programs, because I have spoken to several people, including the people who did the Black Stone River like pilot project and they've done the stuff, the guy that did the stuff in the Boston with the youth works. And so the big piece is having jobs lined up afterwards. So like, you know, the idea is you're training them with, you know, opportunities. So that's something that I'm kind of have been playing around with. And I know that there are various departments also in need of staffing and having someone with that skill set in different departments. Could be helpful in terms of managing staff and and seasonal crews um, but trying to get them into you know full-time positions um and so yeah i just kind of wanted to pitch that to you guys i feel like miles has the expertise and might be a good person to plug into that type of project for training mm -hmm. um and also who knows if you end up needing more crew maybe you would end up wanting to have a slot open um and then allison you know it's a whole network that you have, you've got lots of different groups, <laughs> so. Yeah, I'd be interested in hearing from Miles how, you know, who your workforce, you know, are you, what is it like out there in terms of finding people to work, who understand what's needed? Is that a, you know, is that something that's a blockage or is it, um, is it something where you feel like some jobs programs with this kind of focus would be useful? Yeah, for sure. I absolutely, you know, the workforce right now is um, is uh, honestly uh, the poorest it's probably ever been. Um, and I know that there are a lot of people saying that, but, um, you know, we've, you know, typically, and I, and I say this proudly, we have a lot of interested people that want to come work with us because it's like, there's, you know, they're, and it's a, you know, it's like usually people that are like in their twenties, thirties, like they want to get out, they want to work in the natural environment. They want to remove invasive plants. They want to learn more about the restoration um, business, but like it, over the past, this past year in particular has been a lot tough, more tough to um, find help. We have worked in the past with um, different municipalities, like I'm thinking of like the city of Boston does like an urban work uh, crew within a, in particular, there's a 
um, the director of like the urban wilds division, Paul Sutton. We've, you know, and we've essentially gone in and done, it's something I think similar to what you're talking about, Amanda, which is like moving, you know, and training people like up through development of the work. Like, and we'll go in for certain days and work with them to do, and actually physically work in the environment to learn how to certain tasks. So it could be like, how to identify invasive plants, um, how to, you know, plant a tree properly, um, you know, those sorts of things. Also city of Cambridge, uh, Green Cambridge uh, in particular, there's a group that we've worked with to do um, some, some like summer youth program work. Mm -hmm. And that's also been, that's also been super helpful. There's one was... individual that we have hired um, from that group, although he's like, he's been in school. So he comes and works with us during the summer. Mm -hmm. um, and he's great. Like everyone on the team, like really enjoys, you know, working with him. And he, you know, I mean, I can't imagine, he's like, I think he's uh, 16 or 17 years old. Like, and I can't imagine having that like sort of like leadership. And I'm not talking about for me, I'm talking about from the, like the people who are working with me, like out in the field, like we're, you know, they're, they're a great group and they're super passionate and they like working with kids as like educators. So it's a, I, I love the idea. I'd be totally into, you know, helping you in whatever way to like, um, you know, to do some of the work on the ground. Yeah. Because um, one of the, the key pieces I was also trying to look at was, um, you know, underrepresented marginalized people that are often not in these, you know, positions, kind of giving them a, a chance to go through this workshop, like workforce development program, and then they can kind of decide if they want to take that into like labor, you know, continue to do labor work, or maybe if they want to get, maybe they want to go back to school to actually learn more and get a degree and be an engineer or something, you know, kind of just to uh, open up opportunities and there are a lot of you know kind of just seasonal laborers around and landscaping companies particularly in Framingham that I've just they're everywhere um and oftentimes they they aren't familiar with this stuff they know all the traditional things and kind of opening up that ni this new niche to them um more specialized work yeah and I think that it becomes uh you know something that's so much more you know, what we like to think is it's so much more relevant to what landscaping should be, right? Like we should all yeah. be like more focused on how like planting native plants or how landscapes should function to, you know, to help like restore our resource areas or, you know, all of these sort of things. So absolutely 100% agree with like that sort of direction. I do think if we are able to put together a program, it just like, you know, it 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 creates that um, that vision of like what people feel like they could do, like, in, you know, in the near future, based upon seeing it, you know, taking place. Like I've had met, I've, there's people that work for me that are like, oh, I didn't think I could ever, you know, do you know have a job like this. And then you look out in the natural environment, and it's like the work is everywhere. Yeah, there's like invasive plants everywhere and there's like and more and more the municipalities are having to deal with green infrastructure in their in their towns and like and we should all be planting more for like pollinators and other wildlife so like why not <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the direction it should really be going in